we're going, we're shifting a little bit out of uh, Boston and going to uh, sort of international data here. This paper, my co-authors are two grad students at Jung, in, in my department, Jungwook Lee and Kwa Vu, and my former student, Hyang Dong, who's now at the World Bank. Um, so what is this paper about? Um, Vietnam is often thought of as a success story in education compared to other countries, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, it's a relatively poor country, as we'll see with some charts in a minute, but also um, gets a lot of people through primary school and through lower secondary school. But the thing that really caught everybody's attention was its performance on this PISA exam, Program for International Student Assessment, that's run by the OECD. This uh, PISA has been going on for at least 15, 20 years, but Vietnam first participated in 2012. And when it did so, it did really well. Although it was the poorest of the 63 countries, it scored 12th, um, um, I'm sorry, 16th in math and 18th in reading, and it actually beat out the U.S. and the U.K. Now, I know that uh, I was just looking this morning trying to make this more Minnesota appropriate, and there isn't separate uh, numbers for Minnesota in the PISA, but there are for Massachusetts and Connecticut, which are roughly comparable to Minnesota. Actually, Massachusetts does better than Vietnam. Connecticut does better in reading, but not in math. So, so I think Minnesota is about somewhere close to where Vietnam does. But for the U.S. as a whole and the U.K., uh, Vietnam actually did better in reading and in math, um, and also in science, but I'm not going to show the science results. Okay, um, And then also... Um, as I mentioned, and I'll show you in a second, it's uh, really amazing when you compare that it's the lowest income level, okay? Um, and then there's also, I'm going to show you some graphs from 2015, the more recent data that's available, and again, Vietnam does very well. So let's take a look at this chart here. This graph's on the horizontal axis, the GDP per capita of these countries, um, and on the left, on the, hor on the vertical axis, the score. This is the math test in 2012. Um, and if every dot is a country, and the green line is kind of of ordinary least squares. Uh, least squares uh, uh, but now, I don't know if there's a pointer up here. Maybe not. Okay, Vietnam is a little dot on the vertical. Green, you've got to pull your stuff oh, that one. Okay, there's Vietnam right there. Okay, it's way off the charts. It's the poorest country, but it's scoring, you know, comparable to these richer countries. Okay. So the, the purpose of this paper and this presentation is to try to understand what are they doing? You know, are they doing something that other countries can learn? Um, or is this, maybe this is just a fluke and something funny is going on here. Um, so that's for the uh, math test. And for the reading test, we just see the same thing. Vietnam is out here and doing better than the other countries. Um, for those of you who uh, want a country that's not doing so well, this is Qatar. Um, but that's a different paper, so I'm not going to talk about Qatar very much. Okay, so that's for um, the math scores. Now, there's also, that was GDP per capita on the horizontal axis, but I also have a wealth index here instead, and this is based on the students filled out questionnaires to uh, indicate, you know, does their family have a TV, do they have a car, do they have air conditioning, stuff like this. So we can also use the wealth index because it varies within the countries. The GDP per capita doesn't vary within the countries, but the wealth index does. Again, Vietnam is a big outlier, although now there are some other uh, East Asian countries that are similarly big outliers at higher levels. So that's for the, uh, the math test and then uh, the reading test. It's kind of the same thing. Okay? So we're trying to understand what is Vietnam doing that seems to be... Uh, make it such a high performer for, for such a poor country. Okay, um, and this is for 2015. Again, Vietnam is a big outlier here. Well, there's one country, Moldova, that uh, is even poorer than Vietnam, but for, uh, this was for math, Moldova wasn't that good, but then, uh, and for reading, this is the same thing. So Vietnam is still an outlier uh, in 2015. And Qatar is still also a, an outlier in a, in a negative sense. Okay, so those charts hopefully got your interest into like, you know, what's going on here? Is Vietnam doing something right? You know, are they really getting right? Maybe we need to check these scores. So I'm going to do three things in this presentation. First, I'm going to look at the PISA data and ask the question of, is this really a fair, is this really a, a representative sample of 15-year-old kids 
in Vietnam, and if not, can we adjust it? Um, and then the second thing is, well, okay, after we make these adjustments, Vietnam is still a pretty impressive performer, and so what, can, what explains these gaps? And finally, for those of you who are familiar with labor economics, you know, we're going to do what's called the Oaxaca blinder decomposition. Okay, so let's get to the first point. Um, actually, I was kind of surprised uh, when I saw these results because I've been working on Vietnam for over 20 years and many different things. In Vietnam, uh, most of the kids who are, took those tests in 2012, they went to school for half days, half days, like three and a half hours a day was a typical school day. So I don't understand how, how it was that they performed so well. And uh, the other thing that surprised me is that um, they had a very low enrollment rate on the PISA data, uh, 56%. Okay, most, uh, So basically what the PISA data do is they look at kids who are 15 years old and who are in school. If you're not in school, you don't take the PISA exam, okay? So if you think about it, 56%, if 44% if don't take the test, they're probably the kids who would do the worst because they're not in school. But other countries, a higher percentage is taking this test. So is this really com a fair comparison? So the first thing I do is say, okay, well, in all the countries in the 2012 PISA, um, you know, they more than 50% participated. So why don't we sort of assume that in every country, the top 50% do take the test. Um, and so we'll just look at the top 50%, and then it's more of a fair comparison, okay? If we do that, we see that the rank of the uh, top 50% for Vietnam drops from, you know, 16 or 18 to 40 or 41. So if we just go to the top 50%, uh, we're throwing out a lot of the students in the bottom range for the other countries, and so that makes them go higher, and Vietnam doesn't look so good. However, when you look at the uh, graphs, again, for the top 50%, they still perform very well, okay? And what's going on here, part of the reason why Vietnam is higher above the line is the line got steeper. If you kind of go back uh, to the lines from before, that's 2015. But this line, okay, this is, this is basically the original line. Okay, so that line is, uh, goes from about a little under 400 to a little bit below 550, but if you go to this new one that I was just showing you for the top 50%, uh, it starts around 400 and goes way up uh, over 600 because the line is steeper. So basically the reason the line got steeper is we took, we threw out more kids from the, from the lower performing kids for the higher income countries and so that basically pulled the line steeper. So it still looks good even if we look at the top 50%. So the fact that 44% of the kids in Vietnam didn't participate doesn't seem to explain why they're an outlier. They're still an outlier. So that's it for the math score, uh, for the reading score, the same kind of thing is going on here. And then if you look at, that's 2012 for 2015. Now Moldova, I don't really know what's going on with Moldova, but Moldova is kind of up there with Vietnam as an outlier. This one, it's not so dramatic. This is for math and that's for uh, reading. Um, not quite as dramatic in the sense that there's also some outliers up here. I don't know, Estonia and Poland, things like that. But it's still a big outlier, especially when you look among the poor countries. And I have to admit, I don't really haven't had a chance to figure out what Moldova is doing. It's a small country, I think, with a population of one million that broke off of Romania or something like this. Um, okay, so um, now let's say, okay, it's, it wasn't that Vietnam is, did so well because a lot of kids didn't take the test. However, uh, what if you are in school and took the test? So conditional on being in, in school, um, uh, something really stood out for me, which is that the kids who are in the PISA exam seem to be better off kids. And again, I'm just looking at kids who are in school. Then another data source that I've been working with, the Vietnam Household Living Standards Survey. Now the appropriate column here is to look at the kids in that survey that were interviewed in March through July of 2012 because PISA was done in April of 2012. So you don't want to go to like September, November, because then, then you've got uh, kids who are, um, who are then starting the next grade or something. So the real appropriate column. So something that may be rather suspicious is that first of all, in the PISA uh, sample of kids, only about half were in rural areas. But if you look at the, the Vietnam Household Survey, it's like three fourths are in, in uh, in rural areas. Now, I told this to the people in the OECD, and they said, well, 
you know, this is why the school is located. And maybe what's going on, we have kids located in rural areas, but they go to a school in urban areas, so maybe there's nothing wrong here. But something else kind of stands out, which is that the parental education is higher in the PISA than in the VHLSS. They're much more likely to have cars and computers and air conditioners. So it seems like the kids who are in the PISA, again, we're talking about 15-year-old kids who were in school. They seem to be better off from another data source of 15-year-olds who were in school. And so maybe there's something going on here where either the schools that got into the um, PISA assessment in Vietnam or the kids in those schools that actually took the test, because not every kid takes the test in the school. Maybe there was some, you know, something that the Vietnamese people were doing where they actually kind of cheated a little bit. I don't know if anybody here is from Vietnam. Um, but, and maybe that's why they did so well. Okay. So um, I talked to the people again in the OECD, and they say it's actually pretty hard to cheat. And I asked the Vietnam Ministry of Education, can they send me the list of the schools that participated so I can use another data source that have all the schools in Vietnam? And they, didn't, they said, no, we can't send you the list of schools. So what I could do here is basically say, OK, well, what if we somehow adjusted the PISA score so that uh, the kids uh, actually had these characteristics. Less educated parents, you know, less, more rural, less likely to have these consumer goods and so forth. So basically, now here's where I'm, um, for those of you who don't like regression analysis, you're not going to like this so much, but um, this is really simple, okay? So basically, uh, if we just do ordinary least squares, and this is like a bunch of x variables and the beta coefficients, we can predict the PISA score based on those things, okay? And in fact, what are those x variables? They're actually these variables right here. Sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button. They're actually these variables right here. So I'm going to run a regression of the PISA scores with the PISA data on these variables and get those betas, okay? So I want to get those betas. Actually, the regressions were kind of nice because they actually, again, this is just for Vietnam, uh, they had high R squareds. Um, and so, so it looks like it's a good fit. Okay, why do I do that? Okay, um, let's see. So here's the regressions. Just, they all make kind of sense. You know, rural areas do worse. Girls do better in reading and worse in math. Uh, kids who are in a higher grade do better. If your educated parents are better. If you have a computer, you do better. Although, again, these are not necessarily causal relations. We're just trying to predict the score. Uh, even TVs help, which makes me very uh, doubtful of this predictive relationship. But um, anyways... We're just trying to predict the score. Why are we trying to predict the score? It's because if we take the, the PISA X variables, and remember that table from a few uh, steps back, if we take the PISA uh, X variables, and this is their average there, and we plug them into those betas, we're going to get the, the PISA score. Uh, that's just the way that ordinary least squares work. So if I take the averages for the PISAs and, and plug them into those coefficients, I get the average PISA score. Well, that's what we started with. But what I want to do is say, OK, I think maybe they were cheating a little bit or something funny was going on. Let me plug in the x's from this other household survey, which has nothing to do with the exam. How does that affect the PISA score? So I call that the adjusted PISA score. OK, so maybe if I did that, the score will go down. Because, for example, if you look at these things, you know, uh, parental education has a strong effect on the reading and math scores. But if the average I plug in is lower for that, that household survey data than for the PISA data, that's going to bring the score down. And you know, less kids in rural areas, that's going to also, or more kids in rural areas is going to bring the score down too. So maybe the score is going to drop a lot. Okay. Now, but to give you a little context, let's go back. I'm doing this with the 2012 data mostly. So like, what are we talking about in terms of um, bringing the score down? We're talking about, you know, PISA right, the Vietnam in this graph, it's basically about 100 points higher than the, the line predicts, okay? The same is true of math. So if, if think of that, you know, how much will, this, will the score come down out of 100 points? And the bottom line is, sorry to jump around so much on these things, the bottom line is that it actually didn't drop very, very much. It only, you know, accounting for the fact that maybe the, the kids were selected in some way, only drops the PISA score by 20 to 24 points. So it's really not. And then for the 2005, this reduction is even smaller. 
So even though something a little funny is going on there with who's taking the test, it doesn't really explain you know, away the big gap that Vietnam is way off the charts. It brings it down a little bit, maybe by one-fifth or one-fourth. Okay, so um, that's kind of, let's see. So here's just kind of showing you the details. This is for math. And so you can show that for each of the variables, what is it, what is it that makes the score go down? And actually, it's being in grade 10. If you're in grade 10 in Vietnam, you've passed an exam to go from basically middle school to high school. And so a lot of kids don't pass the exam. But still, the overall effect, the difference between uh, the predicted scores with the, the data, I think, is maybe more accurate than the PISA. It doesn't really mean that Vietnam is no longer a strong performer. That's it for reading. This is it for math. Okay. So basically, after spending a lot of time checking the, the data with what I have, and again, I, I couldn't get the Vietnamese Ministry of Education to give me the, the list of schools. Uh, it doesn't seem like, uh, if there was a little cheating going on in some ways, it doesn't explain why it's a big gap. So something else is going on. So and that was the first of the three questions. The second of the three questions is, well, let's look at the PISA data, which is a really nice data set to try to understand why Vietnam is off the charts, okay? Um, not only did they give these kids these math and reading and science tests, but they also gave, gave the kids a student questionnaire. That's where I got all the information about you know, what's your parents' education and do you have a, a, you know, a, a TV and a computer in your house and stuff like that. There's also a school questionnaire. You get a lot of information about the schools. So basically what I want to do is kind of run a regression where we have the skills here, which is math or reading score, and there's some variables that explain what it is, okay? Um, and so maybe once we kind of explain what it is, if we throw in variables, I mean, those charts I was showing you before, at the risk of repetition or, or making you dizzy or something, I mean, these charts before, all these ones, they're basically, there's only one variable here explaining this. There's this log GDP, and Vietnam is a big outlier, so something else is going on. So if we add more variables, Maybe that'll explain what it is, okay? So that's what I'm going to do, add more variables. And if Vietnam no longer is off the charts or, or above the line, then those variables are kind of telling us this is why Vietnam does so well. Um, and, you know, let me jump ahead. One, uh, let's show you what the variables I want to look at to kind of maybe motivate this. Okay. Well, maybe I went a little too far. Okay, one second. Okay, no, sorry. Uh, there's a chart here that's going to show you all the variables separately for Vietnam. Okay, this is it. Okay, our table. So why might Vietnam do really well? Um, you might say, well, I know some Asian kids or something. They study a lot, you know, and it's true that the Vietnamese students study slightly many more hours per week, but not a whole lot different, okay? They are more likely to go to tutoring classes, especially in math, um, Looking at the schools, uh, teacher absenteeism is slightly less of a problem. There's more pressure of parents on teachers. Uh, the, te the principals are more likely to report that they observe the teachers. Inspectors are more likely to go to schools. But remember, an inspector going to school doesn't mean necessarily that's good for the school. Sometimes they send the inspectors because there's something wrong with the school. So that doesn't necessarily have a causal relationship. Uh, Vietnam is much more likely that teacher pay is related to student performance. Teachers are much more likely to be mentored in Vietnam than these other countries. So these are things I want to try. I want to put into this regression. And if Vietnam is no longer an outlier, then I can say, okay, this is kind of what's going on. So that's what I'm doing here. So let me back up uh, and kind of explain this a little bit. So basically, yeah, I want to put in some more X variables. And if Vietnam is no longer an outlier, then those variables kind of give us the secret to Vietnam's success, maybe. Okay. So, um, well, I'm going to skip this because this is more, maybe more regression. Let's just look at the regressions. Okay, this table, um, there's actually, I haven't added any variables yet. I'm just kind of going along. So these are the original regressions that you saw, GDP per capita, and the Vietnam being off the charts, you know, 136 points above the line, uh, or 119 points above the line for reading, 136 was for math. Um, if I use this wealth instead of that, they're still way off. But then uh, for math, Hong Kong is actually slightly more off than Vietnam. And then when I use wealth at the individual level, which I want to do for various reasons, 
Well, now, again, a couple more East Asian countries look good, but Vietnam is still kind of a big outlier there. Um, so what I want to do now is start adding other things. And so we're focusing on these numbers for Vietnam. So we just have this wealth variable. Vietnam is still 83 points above the line for math, 73 above the line for reading. There are a few East Asian countries that do better than that. Um, and part of the reason they do better than that has to do with the fact that very few people in Hong Kong actually own cars and stuff. But we won't get into that. But if I add more variables, does Vietnam kind of drop down? Instead of being one of the higher ranked people above the line, does it sort of like come down to the line? So maybe it'd be like 30 or 40. Uh, so the first variables I'm going to try here are, um, this is just reviewing what I said. And for those of you who are familiar with this literature, something like this was used by Fryer and Levitt you know, back in 2014. Okay. So first I put in some variables about, you know, one thing, Vietnam has a relatively low uh, uh, sort of fertility rate, so the family size is small. And, and in developing countries, usually larger families, the kids do less well in school. But again, most of the countries in Pisa are already, uh, you know, lo richer countries with a low family size. Um, parents, uh, mother and father, years of schooling. It actually didn't change anything in terms of Vietnam being an outlier. It slightly went less of an outlier in math, but more of an outlier in reading. Okay, and then what about, then I'll throw in some more things, which for those of you who are used to running regressions, these are more exogenous, endogenous in the sense that these are more what parents can do with their kids, you know, when they're in school. I mean, once the mother's got a certain years of education, that's not going to change. These things, the parents are things that they can do. Send them to tutoring classes, you know, that attendance, have a higher attendance rate. Maybe they go to school, you know, every day instead of missing a few days. Well, the bottom line is it didn't really change anything putting in those things. So basically, when I put in all these sort of uh, household level variables, Vietnam is still an outlier. Okay. Well, maybe it's something to do with the schools. Okay. Um, so here I've got all the household variables uh, in there. And the sample size changes a little bit because there's some missing data for the schools. But Vietnam is still like number four, number five in terms of being there above the line. Uh, before I put in these uh, other variables. So these are things about the schools, uh, you know, how many teachers are qualified, uh, class size. Uh, lot, some of these things are kind of strange. Like class size, actually, the higher the class size, the higher the predicted score. But you might, but there's actually this problem, which is that if a school is bad, people tend to leave it and they go to the ones that are better. So maybe that's why class size has this association, which is not necessarily causal. Okay, other things. Um, yeah, teacher absenteeism is bad, but, um, but uh, Vietnam is a little better on that. But the bottom line is there's not a big change. Okay, for math, it's slightly less of an outlier. For reading, there's no change. So basically, when I take all the data from the PISA that I can get my hands on, I can't explain what's going on. So as somebody asked me when I walked in this morning, uh, what's the bottom line of your presentation? Is it's, the answer is we don't know. We can't figure out what Vietnam is doing, okay? But there's still one more thing I'll do. So basically the bottom line is, yeah, it's still kind of an outlier. The same thing is true when they use the 2015. So, so we've got to collect more data. I'll, at the end, I'll kind of tell you what more data we're collecting, okay? Um, okay, the last thing I'm going to do is say, well, maybe there was a mistake, those regressions. I said that the beta coefficients were the same for all countries. So this Oaxaca blinder decomposition, what you can do is say, how let Vietnam have different betas than all the other countries. So basically, we're going to let Vietnam have its own betas. All the other countries have their betas. And then we're going to ask, is the difference in the score due to the fact that the x's are different, or is the difference due to the fact that the betas are different? So without going through all the details, I'll go up here to the, one, the decomposition I like here, which is what's the difference between the mean test score in Vietnam and the mean test score in the other countries? the bars and the means, the means or the averages. Well, basically, it could be due to the fact that the x's are different, you know, using the average beta, the average over the two countries, or it could be that the betas are different, okay? So there's like a difference between Vietnam and the average, multiply the Vietnam x's in between the average and the other countries, multiply the average of the other countries, okay? So this is the decomposition I want to do. How much of this difference in the test scores of the two countries is due to the fact that the, there's difference in the x's, all the stuff I was talking about before, and how much of it is due to the difference in the betas, 
Okay. Well, I can, uh, given that I think uh, there's not that much time, the punchline is it's all due to the betas. Okay. So in this thing, when we're looking at the math, so there's this difference in test scores of 53 or 54 points. Um, and here, you might say, wait a minute, you, you had 100 points before. What's going on here? Here, I'm not conditioning on income. But before, I was saying you were 100 points above the line. Uh, but here, I'm just saying, let's just compare. Forget about the line had to do with the, the, the log GDP or the log wealth. But here, just comparing the countries, Vietnam is 54 points ahead in terms of math. How much does it do to the Xs, adding up over all these things? Actually, it's slightly negative. You know, if anything, the X's for Vietnam are slightly worse than they are, are slightly better than they are for the other countries. So that doesn't, uh, or slightly worse, so that doesn't explain anything. But what about the betas? Well, basically, it's all happening in the betas, and the ones that kind of stand out is, well, more, the kids in grade 10 seem to do much better. You know, being in grade 10 is a big deal for Vietnam compared to the other countries. Um, a days of attendance seems to matter a fair amount. Um, that basically attending an extra year of, of a day in Vietnam, you, you learn about uh, 20 or 25 percent more than ex attending an extra day in other countries. Okay, again, we don't know why that's happening. And then there's also a couple of other things down here, you know, student performance. But it's all happening in the betas. It's not the X's. Okay, so that's for uh, math. The same thing is true for reading. It's all happening in the betas. Um, and here, the, the how much you learn per day really is different. Basically, for reading, you know, you get for every day you attend, you get twice the effect in Vietnam than you do in the other countries. Okay. So the bottom line here is that um, the difference in the betas explains everything. Okay. Which is another way of saying we don't know what's going on. Okay. We just know it's not the the x variables in this data set. Okay. Um, so let me kind of close here to make some time for questions and say, well, given that I have a no, nothing useful to say uh, for this data, what, what, what should we do next? Uh, oh, there's a couple other things I want to talk about before the what we do next part. One is that there's a very nice working paper by Kinesi and other people where they took uh, questions from the PISA and they gave them to the kids in U.S. and in China. And I want to do this for Vietnam, too. Okay, so if anybody has a little extra money, uh, I would like to do this for Vietnam. So what they did is that in both countries, they did another random, you know, Sarah was talking about a randomized controlled trial. I do those, too. And these guys did. So for half the kids, they said, okay, just take the test. Okay. For the other half, they said, right before the test, they said, we're going to give you money. Like, for every question you get right, we're going to give you a dollar. Okay. So in China... Uh, it didn't make any difference. The kids who were like offered money to do better on the test, and they didn't have any time to prepare because they, they made this offer right before they took the test. It didn't matter. They, but for the U.S., it made a big difference. They basically scored 22 to 24 points higher, okay? So in the schools in the U.S. and the PISA, if they had, you know, if you believe this, if they had come out and said right before those kids in the U.S. took the PISA test, we're going to give you, 20, you know, a dollar for every question you answer right, we would have actually done a lot better in the PISA but China would not have made any difference. I have a feeling that it wouldn't make any difference in Vietnam either because people just in China and Vietnam are very similar. I, and I, this is what I want to check. But I think that um, both China and Vietnam, people are really test um, uh, obsessed, really. And so they will, you put a test in from, they try really hard. Like some data collection I'm involved in there that has no consequences for anything. People are like taking out their phones and trying to take pictures of our tests, and we have to try to stop them because they're going to send them to somebody else so that might be taking the test. Uh, so, anyways, this might explain. But again, that you know, this is only about one fourth of the gap. Okay, so if, you know, um, so that may explain part of what's going on. Another thing is sort of uh, that the the teachers are more motivated, um, and in fact, uh, there's. There's a lot of evidence, although the Ministry of Education doesn't want to admit it, but when the, uh, the Vietnam actually prepped the kids to take the PISA, okay? And I don't really know, you know, this is going to be harder to want to figure out, but basically you can, it's perfectly legal when you take the PISA to use old tests and, and uh, have your kids practice. In the Vietnam, I was at a conference in... Uh, August, and they made a big deal about, oh, this test was new. We've, they've never seen it before. We have to really prepare our kids to take this new, unfamiliar test, okay? 
Um, and, but that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with using old tests, but you can get off the PISA website. Okay. In fact, when they first had a practice in 2011, they didn't do very well in the PISA. And so then, then they really went in, and there was all kinds of things going on. And they select the schools, you know, uh, yeah, several weeks before the exam, and they select the kids. In, and the people in the OECD were telling me that they really told these kids, you know, you have to, you know, do well because it's the Vietnam's honors ex at stake. They gave them special T-shirts that said, I was in PISA and all this stuff. So I think they were prepping these kids for the exam. Okay. And then um, I don't have anything for Vietnam, but there are a few really old tests. And if anybody's got a more up-to-date paper that says, if you prep kids for a test, you can, you can, you know, make their, even just for nine hours of prepping for a test, you can get their, their test score to go up by, you know, 0 0.4 standard deviations, which is like 39 points. So it may be that that was going on in Vietnam. In the U.S., I have a feeling we weren't prepping kids for the PISA, although some of you may know more than me about this. Okay? Um, so if you combine this thing with, you know, this prepping and maybe the, that they want to do well on a test where kids in other countries, you have to give them money to do well, maybe that would explain half of it. Okay. So the last thing, uh, what we're going to do, uh, one is that there's another data set uh, with only four countries, India, Peru, Vietnam, and Ethiopia. We have much better data going back to where the kids were one year old. I'm working on that now because I have to present it next week, but it's not quite ready. Um, so this uh, has a much richer, richer set of Xs, okay? And more d detail on teacher absences, though not quite as much. So maybe we're going to have a better uh, success in explaining Vietnam with this other data set. We'll see. Um, but that's it. So I hope that was... Uh, Interesting, although it's not really on Minnesota very much. And any questions you have, I'd be happy to answer. I could have gone on for 10 more minutes. <laughs> All right, if there are no questions, then uh, we can grab a quick coffee. Um, well, we st we're starting 10 minutes early, so maybe we can come back 10 minutes early. and uh, and. Oh, oh there's one, there's one. Okay. There's one question. If you could so, give your name to that. Uh, my name is Ben Austin. Um, I, uh, so, so I know that the, uh, your talk was prefaced with the disclaimer that uh, you don't know why this is happening, but I, I just want to press you on that a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. are, you, you really obviously dived into a lot of data sets. Um, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, are there any even... Um, uh, sort of subjective takeaways that you would uh, take from your data set on Vietnam, whether it is about pedagogy, whether it is about systems uh, that we could apply to learn either in Minnesota or in other states throughout um, mm -hmm. the United States? Yeah. Well, there's sort of two kind of uh, questions there. One is like, although this didn't work so well with the data I had here, do I think there's other reasons um, why it's going on, and, and, and can we, how much do they apply to Minnesota or elsewhere in the U.S. or other countries? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with what's going on in the classroom. Uh, one of the things, there's another, in addition to that four-country data set, the Young Lives, we're collecting, I have money from the U.K. Uh, uh, aid DFID, which uh, to actually take videos, we're doing a lot, we're collecting a lot of data, including taking videos of teachers in the classrooms, and there's people doing this for other countries. I think the way they handle things, um, for example, I'm, I'm still trying to parse it up. In, in many countries, developing countries, there's a big problem with teachers being absent, you know, not showing up and, or not being in the classroom. And Vietnam, that's, that's very low. And people have documented it by you know, doing uh, unannounced visits and things like this. And there is, uh, teachers are held accountable. If they don't do well, they can uh, basically be pushed out of teaching slowly. Um, and the uh, teachers are quite well educated, I think, and they get a lot of training, a lot of uh, what you call in-service training, and uh, a lot of coaching that doesn't happen elsewhere. And they're monitored a lot by the principals and by inspectors. We don't see that in a lot of other countries. Um, so we're hopefully going to have better data on that for, for this uh, in, in the future. So that's what I think. So 
maybe in terms of how it would apply to the U.S., um, I think other people in this room are more qualified than me to sort of say, but I think, yeah, what's kind of, you know, it really depends on what's going on in the classroom. Um, one thing about Vietnam is they tend to get all these kids, you know, to do well, even ones from poor backgrounds, you know, do relatively well, which is not the case in many other developing countries. And there's this kind of uh, ethos, uh, I, I've been trying to get some documentation on this, but ethos that the job of the teacher is to get every kid to perform, you know, relatively well, not to get the top performing kids to like go to the university or something like that. So that's kind of anecdotal, but that's what I hear. I, I, just a, a follow up. Uh, yeah. When you say ethos, do you, do you uh, mean that to say that uh, the issues are sort of cultural or um, uh, just a general practice in, in the classroom, or are there public policies that we can learn from that incorporate that culture? I think it's both, but there are public policies, I mean, people have said that in other countries, uh, an example would be India, which there's going to be a talk on this afternoon, that uh, teachers are, are kind of rated on getting the best kids to, to like be a top scorer in the, in the state or something. But in Vietnam, uh, no, they're kind of, what people look at is how many of all the kids like met some basic criteria, and that's an official government sort of policy. Hi, Ben Horowitz with uh, that here. Uh, I just uh, that last answer kind of made me wonder, based on the conversation we had this morning about the connection between standardized tests and college readiness, mm -hmm. whether your experience looking at the educational system in Vietnam, if you see these higher test scores having an impact also on college attendance and matriculation and um, mm -hmm. post-secondary achievement. Yeah, and in Vietnam, to get to the university, you have to like pass another test. And the number of kids who go to the university just sort of depends on where they draw the line in these tests. So they're trying to get more kids to the universities. They're opening up more universities and kind of letting more kids in. So it's kind of, uh, there's, there's plenty of kids who want to go to the university, and it sort of depends on how many they let in. So it's hard to really make that comparison that, oh, you know, we did a really good job here. In fact, one of the big things that we don't know about Vietnam is, have they always been a top performer? You know, they just started in the PISA in 2012. If we went back to like 2002 or 1995 or something, would they still be an outlier, or did this something, or did this happen in the past 20 years? And we we don't know. We don't have good data on that. So, unfortunately, we don't really know. We, we can't really say that what they're doing well is getting more kids into college. Um, the other thing I was going to just mention is that if you ask people in Vietnam, what do you think of your education system, they complain a lot. They think it's really bad. They think, you know, our kids are, even the kids who come out of the university or college, they don't really have the right kinds of skills. You know, they're supposed to, they're going to introduce a new curriculum. Uh, actually, it should have started like right about now um, where they, they, they teach things more like teamwork and communication and what they call soft skills and so forth, because they, they're always complaining about, you know, employers complain that these students are really not the right kind. They're really good at taking math tests, you know, but maybe not really good at doing what they want the, their employees to do. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, they're not just sitting here thinking they're really happy, we did great on PISA, now we're, we can just relax. No, they really are, are thinking that they need to make a lot of changes in their education system. I, what, a question related to your, uh, when you control for the baseline covariates, then you get the two Koreas and Singapore and Hong Kong. So I'm kind of wondering, should you then be focusing on those five as the mm -hmm. outliers? Yeah. yeah. Actually, there's only one Korea, not the other. Not only South Korea is up in there. Um, yeah, I think so. I think you know, any country that's an outlier like that, we should be looking at to see what they're doing. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Let me just go back. Is that when we started putting in other things, some other countries popped up as outliers that you wouldn't necessarily. Uh, let me go back to where it was. OK, here. So yeah, when, once we started controlling for these, uh, some of the things, you know, Finland popped up. Everyone likes Finland, in fact. You know, Finland is overrun by people visiting, trying to understand why Finland is so great. And then uh, a few other countries popped up, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, uh, 
Yeah, so there's, there's other, not just East Asian countries, but there's other ones that do well. And I think, yeah, the people should be looking at those countries to try to understand what they're doing because they're, they're also like performing very well once we control for these other things. Okay, well, thanks very much.